The text will be in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. The title is Herod's Self-Made Snare. Herod's Self-Made Snare. Mark 6 is the story about Herod's birthday. And on his birthday, he has the daughter of Herodias come in and dance for him. And he's so pleased by this dance that he promises her she can have up to half the kingdom if she wants it. All she, yeah. All she's got to do is ask. And so then she runs to Mama and says, what should I ask for? Mom says, well, get the head of John the Baptist. Let's cut that guy up. We're done with him. So that's what she asked for. She asked for John the Baptist's head on a charger. And they do it. They behead him. That's where John the Baptist dies. <clears throat> now, Herod, you can see from his life that he actually liked John the Baptist. They had some run-ins, but he liked John the Baptist. But I'm going to show you a problem with Herod was he built his own trap and he fell in it. In Proverbs 5, verse 22, the Bible says this, His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. Sin does something. You get involved in sin, you may have the desire to do right, but you've already built some cords that will hold you in sin. You can't get out, even though you desire to. You may, with one part of your mind, say, I want to go after God and I really want to quit this wicked living. However, after having built your own trap of sin, if you've snared yourself, you may not get out. That's why it's important to stay away from sin. All right, back to our text. In Mark 6, look at verse 14. Mark 6, verse 14. And King, uh, and King Herod heard of him. That's talking about Jesus Christ. For his name was spread abroad. And he said, uh-oh, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. This is what an impression John the Baptist had made on Herod. When he hears about Jesus Christ's fame, he says, Oh, that reminds me of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had made an impression. Look at verse 20. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Now, we don't often think of that, but... Herod gladly heard John the Baptist. He wanted to go to his meetings. <laughs> if John the Baptist was preaching, he would clear his calendar so he could go listen. Hmm. But you know what? He's the one that beheaded him. That tells us something. It's not so important that you're interested in hearing it. Are you interested in doing it? We're in Mark Turn back to chapter 4. Mark 4, look at verse 16. Jesus has been given the parable of the sower and the seed. Mark 4, 16. These uh, are they likewise which are sown on the stony ground. You want to find out if you've got a stony heart? He's going to tell you who it is. Who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. You wouldn't think of those people as being stony. Jesus says, yes, they are. Just because they receive it with gladness does not mean they're, they're all, you know, just confused. and No, they're stony hearts. Most Christians attending the big assemblies right now today are full of stony hearts. They're going there for glad tidings, and they will receive it happily. However... They don't intend to do anything with it. Look at verse 17. And have no root in themselves, so endure for a time. But after, when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Does the Bible offend you? It should. But does it offend you to the point where you no longer want to gladly hear it? <laughs> then you've got a stony heart. When the Bible offends you, just be as glad to hear it as it was when it was telling you the blessings. Because it doesn't offend you to hurt you, it offends you to help you. That's Herod's problem. Herod got offended. He gladly heard John the Baptist. He was intrigued by him, but he was offended by him too. 
In Psalms 106, verse 11, this is a recount of the history of Israel. We find Israel had stony hearts too. <laughs> if we're not careful, we will too. Psalms 106, verse 11 says, And when the waters covered uh, their enemies, there was not one of them left. Woo, that sounds like deliverance right there. Their enemies are gone. Verse 12. Then they believed his words. Wow, well, guess so. They sang his praise. Okay, they did more than just believe it. They sang about it. They're going to tell everybody. Of course, there's nobody around that would oppose it. <laughs> Verse 13. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. You don't wait for his counsel, you're going to get somebody's counsel. Herod got some counsel that was no good. In John 5, verse 35, Jesus says about John the Baptist to the Israelites, he says this, He was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. We have the light from heaven right here in our hand. Are we willing for longer than a season to enjoy it? to stay dedicated to it, to follow it. You know, most people, I'm thinking right now of someone who's, um, it's probably been two years since they decided they were going to read through their Bible. And you can't tell me it takes you two years to get through the Bible. What I would like to do with anybody who thinks it takes them more than a year to get through the Bible is compare it to the amount of words they've put on Facebook versus the amount of words that are in a Bible. If they can publish that many words, they can read that many words of God. There's no excuse. Okay, just because this is a burning and shining light doesn't mean it's just for a season. It's for life. Let's find Herod's problems. Mark 6, verse 26. Mark 6, verse 26. I'm going to take the whole sermon from one verse, and I'm going to break it up into phrases. Mark 6, 26. He says, And the king, this is talking about Herod, was exceeding sorry, exceedingly sorry, yet for his oath's sake, and for their sake which sat uh, with him, he would not reject her. That's Herodias' daughter asking for John the Baptist's head. <clears throat> now, we've got a clause there. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet. And now I'll show you the yets. He would not reject her. Now, that's many of a human's problem, is a sinful influence. Many a man knew better, but would not do better, because he wouldn't reject the woman who was influencing Look at Samson and Delilah. He knew better. You can't have told that woman one false thing after the other and wake up to her trying to pull the trick on you and not know. But he had a love for Delilah that outweighed reason. Okay, that's Herod right here. He's the king. He likes John the Baptist. However... He does not want to reject this bad influence. Now it's more than just a human influence. There's satanic power behind it. And you, you look at, um, who's the other one? Jezebel. Jezebel and Ahab. Ahab is run by that woman. <laughs> now, I, there are some good qualities to Ahab. We don't think about it, but there are. He humbled himself before God there at the end. And God lengthened his life because of it. But Jezebel, she was a wicked woman. And she had some kind of power over him. Not only that, she had some kind of power over Elijah. The powerful prophet who just killed 800 prophets of Baal and, and her prophets. You know, you would think he was a spiritual stronghold. But yet this woman gets mad at him and he runs for the hills. There's some satanic influence and people who are used as devices of the devil that will hold sway over you 
if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and you give ear to the wrong things. There's a wickedness out there that we've got to be aware of. In Mark 6, 24, Mark 6, 24, we find that wickedness takes orders from someone. This is the daughter. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Mm. Now, it, I don't know how old this girl is at this point, but at any rate, a female. You know, this is supposed to be the delicate side of humanity. <laughs> Goes to Mama Dearest and says, Hey, I can get, I've got a blank checkbook here. What amount do I fill it out with? And Mama says, Let's cut somebody's head off. <laughs> As a young little innocent girl, that should horrify you. But no, that satanic power is there. And she asked for it. There's an influence there. Now that influence is over Herod himself. And this woman gets what she wants. In Ecclesiastes 7 verse 26. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 26. Ecclesiastes 7 26. The Bible says, And I find more bitter than, de than death the woman so death can be bitter it can be bad it can be harsh but there's something worse it's a woman <laughs> whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands whoso pleaseth, whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her but the sinner shall be taken by her that's Herod he's taken mm-hmm Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the sinner shall be taken by her you start playing with sin guess what happens a wicked woman's coming after you and she's full of snares and traps and nets the woman should be the conscience of a society but I find in this age right here, women have become just as wicked or more wicked than men were when I was growing up. It was not normal when I was growing up to hear a woman with filthy language. But nowadays, the women are just as filthy as the wicked men were in my day. Women can be very wicked. And if the woman goes wicked, he says right here, they become a snare and a trap. Why? Because a man will do what a woman wants him to. The woman holds some power over a man. And here we see the king was controlled by a woman. Look at uh, Mark 6, verse 20. He says, For Herod feared John... Obviously, the fear he had of John was not as much as the fear he had of Herodias. <laughs> because he was too scared, he would not reject her. Even though there was some fear of God in him because of John the Baptist, it wasn't enough to make him refuse wickedness. That's what happens when you start playing with sin. It messes with your mind. It puts you in bondage. In Jeremiah 44, verse 17. Here's some people Israel, uh, in Israel that have been confronted with this very thing. God, this is the problem. God does things in our lives. He does things in everybody's life. He's not just, he's trying to reach everybody. He's not willing that any should perish. He orchestrates events in everybody's life. The problem is they don't recognize it as God. If you don't recognize it as God, it's the same as if you don't understand the language that's being spoken to you. God's trying to talk to us. Jeremiah 44, 17. The people's reply, But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven, there's a female, and to pour, our, uh, pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we, our fathers, our kings, our princes, in the city of Judah, 
and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals. Well, that's an important thing. And were well, <laughs> and saw no evil. They said, hey, it was the queen of heaven who gave us all this stuff. So because of that, we're going to go. They didn't realize it was God who gave it to them. Even while they were doing wickedness, God was still doing them good, and they attributed the goodness to the wicked influence. Ouch. That's going to make God mad. <laughs> and it does. In Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, verse 22. In our story, it said of Herod that he was very sorrowful. Um, we find this sorrow is not enough to make any difference in his life. The sorrow doesn't cause him to make any right decisions. It's just a fleeting sorrow. Ah, oh, too bad I got to kill him, but chop his head off. Go ahead. Here it is, Luke uh, 18, verse 22. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come, follow, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, just like Herod, for he was very rich. Sometimes sorrow is a... Um, a potion that wakes you up. You know when you, when you fall out, when you faint, they break that, that uh, smelling sauce thing and they wave it under your nose and it's supposed to wake you up. That's what sorrow is supposed to do. Sometimes God uses sorrow to try to wake a person up. Here, the sorrow didn't wake him up. He just continued going the wrong direction. But that was God's warning sign. The sorrow was, hey, look at righteousness. Verse 24. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Why? Because his sorrow can be masked by money. That's how he'll try to mask it. But money won't mask sorrow. Sorrow is something you'll feel in your bed at night when you're trying to sleep. Sorrow is something that will haunt you in the middle of a crowd when you think you're having a good time and inside you know you're not. God uses sorrow. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, make that sorrow a godly sorrow. Use the sorrow to become godly. <laughs> Turn to God. 2 Corinthians 7, 10, the Bible says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. In sorrow, you're going to run one way or the other. It's an accelerator. You've pushed the gas pedal with sorrow. Sorrow pushes you into one direction or the other, either farther into the world, or you can get repentance and turn toward godliness. That's what sorrow will do for you. God's tried to use sorrow twice now we saw in Mark once with the young rich ruler, and once with Herod. Here's a, the line of a stanza that, of a poem that Rachel wrote. I'll give you the end of it. You can fool others, but you can't fool God. He knows if you're a fraud. Repent, get right. It's not against flesh and blood we fight. If you do not heed this warning as true, then the devil has already deceived you. That's a fact. If you'll use sorrow the correct way, it can be good. It can be godly. However, if sorrow does not make you turn to God, it ensnares you. It traps you, just like Herod. Godly sorrow is sorrow that you've hurt God, you've offended God. Worldly sorrow can be sorry for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, sorry I got caught. Sorry for the circumstance. Um, but yeah, use it to propel you toward God. You can be sorry that you got in the circumstance and realize, hey, God's in control of it. I wouldn't have got in this circumstance if I hadn't done something that made him 
Say, hey, jump in that bucket right there, buddy. You deserve it. <laughs> and really, nothing in ha happens in this life by chance. The Creator's in control of all of it. Use it as some way to make you get closer to Him, conform to His image. Okay, that's one trap that Herod fell into, was a sinful influence of that wicked woman. Here's another one, a sinful institution in Mark 6, 26. Mark 6, 26, our text. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake he would not reject her. There was an oath he had given that you can have up to half my kingdom. So for the very oath's sake, okay, I gave a promise. It has to be upheld. Okay, that's a wrong institution. People are following institutions right into the pit of hell. We talked about it a little in Sunday school. The, the problem with people is they want to follow something someone else has said because it takes responsibility off of them. If I realize that I'm responsible to God and he's talking to me in a book, and if I don't listen to what he says, he's going to hold me accountable. That becomes a lot more important than if I say, he's going to tell that man up there what to tell me. And he didn't say this and this is wrong. He didn't hit my sins. He missed this one and this one, so I'm okay. Uh-uh. You're not held accountable to a man. You're held accountable to God. Big difference. Don't trust in an institution. He did. The institution of a law. Okay, I've given a law, therefore I'm going to follow it. You owe no allegiance to the devil. You know what salvation is? Salvation is breaking the law of the devil to get a new one. The wages of sin is death. That's the law. It's an institution. You know what we did? We broke it. But the gift of God is eternal life. So the Christian life is all about breaking the institutions that can harm you by following Jesus Christ. I see so many people take and make promises to the devil and wickedness that they know is wicked. And they say, well, I've already made my promise. I've bought my ticket. You know, I've done this. I've done that. I'm going to fulfill this wickedness. And then I won't do it again. Baloney. You're already trapped. Don't follow an institution that the devil uses to enslave you. God set us free from that mess. In Psalms 10, Psalms 10, verse 4, the Bible says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. That's, that's a proud thing right there. To think, God will sit and wait on me. Mm. Mm -mm. It's never right to do wrong. Everybody knows that. You can't say, I've made this promise, therefore I've got to be a man of my word and follow the devil even though I know it's... No, sir, if it's wrong, quit it. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. But for some reason, the devil will fool many people's minds into thinking you've got to obey wickedness because you've promised to obey wickedness. No, sir. He serves my God. My God says you don't have to obey him. <laughs> In Matthew 12, verse 37. Matthew 12, verse 37. Herod's got a problem. He should have never made that promise. <laughs> Don't open your mouth and start letting it flap without your brain being in gear. <laughs> Matthew 12, 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Ouch. He set his own trap. He told her you can have half of my, up to half my kingdom. He shouldn't have done that. If he likes something, give her something. Don't give her a blank check. That was stupid. 
Well, he didn't have to do that, and he nobody expected him to give a half of his kingdom. That was a figure of speech. Um, he didn't have to fulfill that. However, he felt trapped, and he was under probably demonic oppression at that point. He should not have been opening his mouth and flabbing, letting it flap and say whatever it just felt like. That was he was emotionally driven, not logical. Yeah, probably drunk too, yeah. The oath was bad. Stupid, stupid thing to do. However, honoring the wicked oath was a double sin. That's wicked. Proverbs 13, verse 3, the Bible says this. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. If Herod had just not spoken, <laughs> there would have been a lot more life around but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Hard thing to do. The longer you live in life, the more of this you'll realize. One of the best things and the hardest things to do is before something comes out of your mouth, play it through in your head. <laughs> and try to judge what's the reaction going to be. What's this going to cause? That's exactly what the verse says. That's what God says. God says, shut your mouth and open your brain first. Then if your brain says do it, then you can open your mouth. Otherwise, somebody else is running that mouth. Because your brain didn't think it through. Who made that mouth move? Mm. Uh, in Psalms 73... Psalm 73, verse 5. Psalm 73, verse 5. This is talking about the wicked people. Psalm 73, 5. They are, not in, uh, they are not in trouble as other men. And sometimes you think that. Well, we, we would look at Herod and say that. Well, he's the king. I mean, he's not in trouble. Neither are they plagued like other men, as far as what we can see on the outside. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain. You know what a chain does? It locks you down. Violence covereth them as a garment. Yeah, Herod's chain forced him to butcher John the Baptist. Verse 7, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. That's what they think they have. What they actually have is bondage. They're ensnared. They're trapped. Sin's running the show, not them. That was one of that was the second problem. First problem we saw was a sinful influence, sinful institution. Now let's see a sinful insecurity. You know, it's it's if you've if God's been giving you security in His Word, like it's sinful for me to worry about God going back on His Word and me losing my salvation. That's a promise he's promised me. That would be sinful for me to waste my time worrying about that. That would be a sinful insecurity. Now let's see some sinful insecurities. Mark 6, verse 26. And the king was exceeding sorrowful, uh, exceedingly sorry, yet, end of the verse, for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. Okay, so now he's doing it because there's a crowd around him that might look down on him. He might look bad. Guess what? That crowd's not going to be there tomorrow. Furthermore, he's the king. He can snap his fingers and get a crowd anytime he wants to. Why is he now trying to live for the crowd? That's like Jezebel walking in there, saying, Ahab, why are you crying looking at the wall? Aren't you the king? Well, watch what I do. Well, wait a minute. If he's the king, then let him go be king. But she says, oh, no, you're the king, but just sit down and let me play king. And that's what she did. Now, here's the same thing going on with Herod. The crowd is running him. He's not running them. He's afraid, he's so insecure that this crowd, he's got to hold their applause. 
He's got to make them happy. He doesn't want to look bad to the crowd. That'll get you in big trouble. Stay away from trying to appeal to a crowd. Very rarely is the crowd ever right. It's the individual. Look at Proverbs 13, 20. Proverbs 13, 20. The Bible says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. And that doesn't mean you can be a fool and go find some wise men and start walking behind them. <laughs> that doesn't make you wise. It means if you're wise and you'll learn, you can go hang out with wise people and keep your mouth shut and let your brain open. <laughs> and maybe you'll learn something. Now, it doesn't say that you mimic them or you become a parrot. God makes you an individual. God doesn't have parrots. He has individuals. He says the rest of our verse, But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. There's two crowds out there. There's a wise crowd and there's a crowd of fools. Fools are full of destruction. If you're going to hang with the fool, don't be surprised when you get destroyed right alongside them. You know what fools do? They're violent. What ended up happening with Herod? He killed, murdered John the Baptist because of some wicked satanic influence from a woman. In Genesis 13, verse 12, Genesis 13, 12, we find somebody else who started following the wrong crowd. Total destruction followed. And he just about wound up destroyed with it. Genesis 13, 12. Abraham dwelt in the, Can in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. You know how it starts? Just thinking about it. Don't be daydreaming about wickedness. Don't be daydreaming about the wicked crowd. That's how he started. He, start, he was not dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't run down there right to Sodom and Gomorrah. He dwelt in the plain. He was out separate. And he just had his tent face in that direction. So he could see if there was anything new going on down there. I mean, hey, they might have some new inventions i got to go check out. I'm not going to live down there. But it wasn't long before he was. Stay away from the crowd. Don't dream about the crowd. Don't watch the crowd. <laughs> In 1 Kings 12. 12. This is Jeroboam. Rehoboam. Jeroboam. J comes first. Jeroboam. <laughs> Solomon's son. But he forsook the counsel of the old men. That's 1 Kings 12, 8. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and counseled with the young men that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. Isn't that typical? We'll get counsel. Everybody's going to seek somewhere for counsel. You know where Herod ran for it? A wicked woman. That's where he took his orders. You're going to find counsel. You know what most people do? They find somebody who's going to tell them what they already have decided they want to hear. You find somebody, I, I'm very against this, I need you to be my counselor. I don't want to be your counselor. That means I'm saying something that's uh, tickling your ears. And I don't want to do that. Let God tell you what you need to be. He's the mighty counselor. What most people do is they'll sign up with a counselor until that counselor says something that offends them. And then they go run and get them a new one. We don't need counselors. We've got the counselor. That's right. And sometimes he offends us. But that's our fault. <laughs> Here, he's going to run out and get some counselors that will tell him just what he wants to hear. Now, those counselors are stupid. He's not going to do them well either. When he gets all power and can be just as mean as he intends to be, those counselors are going to be put enslaved too. <laughs> it's not going to go too well with them. Don't be stupid and don't counsel the stupid. <laughs> In 1 
in 1 Kings 22.4. 1 Kings 22.4. This is Ahab and Jehoshaphat. 1 Kings 22.4. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, that's the king in the south, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, I am as thou art, and my people is thy people. And my horses is thy. No, you're not. If y'all were the same, how come you're both a king? Somebody's got to rule. <laughs> Turn over your rulership to him if you're thinking you're the same. And you want to impress him. And that's exactly what happened. He started making himself try to fit in. And when he did, it just about cost him his life. Uh, look at Second Chronicles nineteen two. Second Chronicles nineteen two. And Jehu the son of Hanani the seer went out uh, to meet him, and said unto King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly, and love them that hate the Lord? You better investigate the people you hang around. Do they love the Lord? Does God hate them? Is God mad at them? Let's read our verse. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Wow. He just identified him. He said, you're a companion of fools. You want to go get in good with Ahab? Guess what? He hates God and God hates him, and therefore God's mad at you. Wow. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. This is something good to remember. No man can be a gentleman without being a Christian. And I don't mean it in the way the world's using the word. I mean, unless you've dedicated yourself to Christ and intend to follow him. Because that's what gives you good manners. The world can't give you good manners. Here he says, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Somebody's going to try to fool you. Evil communications corrupt good manners. You won't even be a good humanist if you hang out with evil people. It's just a fact. You know what happened? Jehoshaphat just about got himself killed. He was hanging out with some evil people. Herod, hanging out with an evil crowd. Wickedness. Manners are going to go right out the window. You're not going to be very appealing to the world you think that you're appealing to soon. In John 18, 18. John 18, 18. Here's Peter at the crucifixion of Jesus. John 18, 18. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Hmm. Stay away from the wicked crowd. You know, a lot of Peter's problem could have been averted had he just stayed out of the crowd? Now, I know it was prophesied that that's what he was going to do. And so, Jesus looked in the future and said, Yes, that's what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do. However, had he not had the propensity to go hang with the wrong crowd, he wouldn't have been there when the rooster went off. <laughs> but that's where he is. Don't go... Now, he's got a good excuse, doesn't he? It was cold. That's what the verse says. It was cold. Okay, so you need a fire, don't you? We can come up with all kind of excuses to be with the wrong crowd, to do the wrong thing. How about coming up with an excuse to not do that? <laughs> the wicked people are there. That's a good excuse to not be there. <laughs> but there he is with the wrong crowd trying to warm himself. Ephesians 5 or 7, the Bible says... 
Be not ye therefore partakers with them. If they're wicked, stay away from them. Verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. God's children ought to walk differently than the world. A king should be different than the crowd. How come he, uh, he what's his name? Herod. <laughs> How come Herod is taking orders from the crowd? He's afraid to offend the crowd. He's scared of those that sit with him. He doesn't want to offend them. Wait a minute. You're the king. Spiritually, we're kings and priests to God. Okay, so we should be different than the crowd. We should walk as children of light. We should be different. One last verse, and we'll shut this down. Revelation 18, verse 4. Revelation 18, 4. Now, Herod was wicked. There was nothing godly about Herod. However, Christians can fall in that same trap. And you and I have before. And if you think about it a little bit, you'll, re you'll remember it. <laughs> There's times in life where you wake up and you say, Hey, look, I'm trapped by this. God, help me. Get me out of here. And he will. But you've got to repent and turn to him. That godly sorrow thing. Here he is, Revelation 18, verse 4. This is the way God talks to his people. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. God has one message to his people. Get holy. That's our mission in life. If you're still here living and breathing, you got one mission. Get more holy. Okay, how are you going to do that? It's not by hanging out and appealing to the wrong crowd. You can go to the wrong crowd and try to change them, but don't go to the wrong crowd to fit in. There's a big difference. Jesus' message, God's message all the way through the whole Bible is come out of wickedness, be separate, get holy. Don't be Herod, be holy.